A few months back, I had Sean McDowell on the broadcast here. Sean, of course, a great apologist in his own right, but the son of world-renowned apologist Josh McDowell. And look at the bio here. It's It almost sounds made up, but it's true. Since 1961, Josh has delivered more than 27,000 talks to over 25 million people in 125 countries. He's the author, a co-author of 145 books, including More Than a Carpenter and New Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Recognized by World Magazine as one of the top 40 books of the 20th language. Josh's books are available in over 100 different languages. You've all been blessed and helped by Josh McDowell's material. Josh, what a joy and honor to bring you to the line of fire for the first time. Hello, Dr. Brown. Hey, it's uh, we've run into each other a few different settings, but it's it's great to finally get you on the broadcast with us. Well, yeah, I don't know who is hardest to get a hold of, you or me. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, here we are. Hey, uh, before we get into the, the, your new book on the beauty of intolerance, uh, how how many college campuses have you spoken to, or guesstimates of how many young people you've addressed over the it's, years? It's a little over a thousand two hundred sixty universities. Wow. Probably no one else has ever done 300, and it's about now it's about 45 million young people. Extraordinary. And what would you say is the biggest difference or some of the biggest differences between now and when you first started? Well, there's probably one major one is on uh, truth. Say 20 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, you didn't have to defend truth. Basically, truth was believed to be that which was external, which coincided with reality. And so you could appeal to truth, and everybody would understand you. Now, that has totally changed. It's gone from truth being objective outside of yourself to subjective truth within yourself. And uh, so now, basically, when the most popular phrase used in youth culture over the world is it might be true for you, but it's not true for me, simply means, well, if you believe it, it's affected your life, then it's true for you, no matter what. And so now, for example, I just finished a complete rewrite on new evidence that demands a verdict. Yes. And half the chapters are different. For example, I start out, is there such a thing as truth? You see, when I wrote new evidence, I didn't have to defend truth. Now you have to defend truth. Can you know truth? Is there such a thing as knowledge that you can have knowledge of history? And so that's probably one of the biggest differences. And then... The challenge used to be when they would challenge you, uh, how do you know that's true? Now they say, well, what right do you have to say that? You're intolerant. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and it's a shift away from objective truth to subjective truth. That's probably the biggest. And the other is, 20 years ago, kids were saying, well, I want to deal with the problems of the world. Now they're saying, I've got a problem. Wow. And a shift from concern so much for the world to concern for the individual. Got it. Um, And then, of course, that's rolled over into the same-sex marriage, transgender, everything. Because if all truth is personal, then what right do you have to judge anyone? Right. Uh, If there's no external reference point, then how can you say my lifestyle is not as righteous and just as your lifestyle. So that's kind of the changes. Now, what what about the fact that young people are getting exposed to objections to the Bible, objections to God at younger ages today because of Internet and social media? Well, that's happening at a lot younger age. And most pastors and parents are not waking up to this. The Internet has changed everything. For example... Questions that I used to hear about the deity of Christ, the resurrection, the Bible, truth, etc. By third, fourth year students in the university, you now hear 11, 12, 13 years old. Mm. Because the internet has taken it younger and younger and younger. And 20 years ago, atheists, agnostics, uh, had very little access to our young people. Today, they're just one click away. They have the same access that a church has. And so, but I don't mind that because I think we should be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in us. 
Right. The problem is the Internet has brought all these questions up to young people, but the church hasn't prepared people to answer them. And then what about the effect of pornography on the younger generation? Has, has that been something that you've monitored as well? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. About six, seven years. Because I started to notice that, so, you know, I'm an apologist, present truth. And I said, no, there's something affecting the behavior, the attitude, the truth claims of young people. It took me several years to find out it was. It's pervasive internet pornography. Mm. And uh, pornography right now is by far the greatest threat to the cause of Christ in the history of the church. Nothing, nothing in the history of the church comes close to it. Like Chuck Swindoll says, it's the greatest cancer in the history of the church. Um, And if we don't deal with pornography, I don't care how much you pray. I don't care how much you teach the Word of God. I don't care how many churches you start. I don't know how many group, home group situations you have. We will lose. We will lose. Uh, that 53% of pastors, evangelical pastors, say in our church we don't have the problem of pornography. Right. right. What that means is it's probably the greatest disconnect in the history of the church between pastors and its people. There's not one single church in the world, in the furthest jungles of Africa, Asia, Indonesia, whatever, that is not affected by pornography, not one. And here in the United States, only 7% of evangelical churches has any program or any means to help those addicted to pornography. Only 7%. But to show you how big it is, most people don't realize how big it is. There's 26 million pornographic websites that I can access right this moment on my cell phone. Two billion pornographic web pages. Now, one site, just one site in the last 30 days, transferred data, produced and transferred, 29 petabytes of pornographic data in the last 30 days. What is 29 petabytes? If printed out, this one of 26 million sites, this one site in 30 days, would fill 540 million four drawer file cabinets. Oh my. That's only one site in 30 days. Another site, every single day this last year, 365 days, has produced about 1.2 to 1.3 petabytes distributed of pornographic data. Printed out. Every day, they would fill the entire Empire State Building. Another one, every two seconds, they'd begin 4,000 new pornographic videos being viewed. And that's one site. <laughs> so these three sites are, are not even in the top three. And so uh, these people say, well... I don't have to worry about it. My kids won't look for pornography. That's about the dumbest, stupidest statement I've ever heard in my life. And it comes from a lot of Christian moms, homeschoolers. Well, my kids won't look for it. They probably won't. The issue is pornography will find them. It will find them. So, yes, you, you ask the right question. With the young people, the first thing that happens they start to question authority, the authority of the Bible, the authority of Christ, the authority of the church, the authority of their parents. That's one of the first things. Second, they develop an aggressive view of sexuality, a very aggressive view. And women now that are exploding with pornography, not all women are this way, but so many of the research shows Women watch pornography to learn how to save their marriage. Mm. And women and girls watch different types of pornography. Pornographers know that, and they produce it. Um, They produce relational pornography for women. For young girls, which is probably the most rapid growing of pornography, uh, 13, 16, 17-year-olds, or even younger, 11, uh, they watch pornography for two reasons, mainly. 
One. Hey, Josh, tell you what, I've, I've got to jump in. We've got a break. We come back. You can finish this off. This is devastating stuff from Dr. Josh McDowell. And then we'll talk about his new book, The Beauty of Intolerance. Time to be sober and vigilant, friends. I'm tremendously honored to have with me Dr. Josh McDowell. Uh, no apologist that I know of in church history has had the world impact that he has by God's grace. And he burns with passion to continue to get the truth out to a lost and confused world. His latest book with his son, Sean, The Beauty of Intolerance. Uh, so, uh, Josh, right before the break, you were giving us staggering figures about homose- uh, about pornography, staggering figures. And you were talking about porn that's specially made for, for women or for, for girls that yeah. comes at it from a different angle. For girls, it's just girls watch. They come at girls and women with more relational porn set within a context of a relationship. With men, it's just straight out porn, uh, hardcore. With girls are watching porn, mainly for two reasons. One, how can I keep my boyfriend? What do I need to do to keep my boyfriend? Or second, how can I get a boyfriend? Mm. That's why they watch porn. Extraordinary. So, so Josh, in, in short, and you obviously have to sound by things more than ever. When you have a generation that does not accept an, an external standard and that subjectifies truth, where do you start to point them to the fact that there is absolute truth? Well, I start them with the fact that um, how do they determine reality? What is their consideration of truth? And I found I've almost always been able to do this to bring it back to the, uh, oh, my mind just went blank, to the, uh, oh, correspondent theory of truth. Okay. That truth is that which coincides with reality, or truth is that which is, or truth is that which has fidelity to the original, meaning the same as equal to the facts. And so I'll say, how do you know that, uh, oh, geez, how, when they ask me a question of truth, they'll say, how do you know that's true? And they'll say, well, why does it even matter? I said, well, do you want the truthful answer or the non-truthful answer? Mm-hmm. They always say the truthful answer. So I say, well, there must be that which coincides with what is. If, is it raining out? Like I'm sitting here in Southern California in my home looking out over a beautiful park about 75 degrees, and if somebody makes a statement, well, it is snowing out, I'll say, is that a true statement? Well, how do you know? Truth is that which coincides with reality. If outside there was falling white substance defined as snow, then the statement was true. Why? It corresponded with reality. But in this situation, the statement would be false because it doesn't correspond with reality. And it's the same in studying the scriptures on the resurrection. It says Christ was raised from the dead. Well, how do you know that is a true statement? Well, you have to check out the evidence. Does it coincide with what is and what happened? And that's usually how I start. But I'll start asking them to define truth, and most people can't. Yeah, Uh, amazing, amazing. But just the simple way to get them to think, to draw them out of that. All right. Um, the new book, The Beauty of Intolerance, obviously that gets you in these days branded hater, homophobe, bigot, transphobe, whatever other phobe there might be. Uh, intolerance is an ugly thing. And yet you're saying in a right way, it can be a beautiful thing. So explain that for our listeners. Well, I created a T-shirt that caused a lot of <laughs> unrest among people. In the big white letters across the black T-shirt in the front, it said, big letters, intolerance, and then it said, is a beautiful thought. People would walk up to me. They'd get upset. You're a racist. You're intolerant. Oh, they get, I wouldn't say a word to anyone. i just turn around. The back, it says, isn't it wonderful that Martin Luther King Jr. was intolerant of racism, Mm -hmm. that Mandela was intolerant of apartheid, that Bonhoeffer 
was intolerant of racism. That Mother Teresa was intolerant of poverty. And every single person goes, whoa, I never realized that. I said, that's right. Uh, and so tolerance is a concept you really can't live. It's the number one virtue in the world today in almost every nation, every university, everywhere, and you can't live it. You cannot live the concept of tolerance. Why? Because the word tolerance has gone through a total change. That's why we had to write the book, The Beauty of Intolerance. Tolerance used to mean, look, I don't agree with you, but you have a right to believe it, but I don't agree with you. Today, that is intolerance. Because today, tolerance has shifted where all values, all beliefs, all lifestyles, all claims to truth are equal. And if you dare to say there's any value, belief, lifestyle, or claim to truth greater or lesser than another, then you are a bigot and intolerant. Well, you can't live that way. This is why uh, the prime minister of England came out and said, multiculturalism, tolerance. Is a, is a failed concept. Merkel of Germany, before the big convention of the young people for a party came out and said, multiculturalism and tolerance is a failure. The president of France, the heart of tolerance, came out in the uh, parliament of EU and saying, tolerance is destroying our culture. And this is probably why England just voted on Brexit. To exit the EU mainly because of tolerance and multiculturalism and the way it's destroying every culture in England. Mm. So that's why we had to write the book, The Beauty of Intolerance. For ex- here's an example. Right now, we have in the evangelical church the first full-blown culture of tolerance. And they say, Josh, how can you say that? Look at pornography. 93% of those 24 years old and younger will say, that they don't have a friend who would say intolerance is wrong, and most of their friends are Christians. You take 18 to uh, 34 year olds, 18 to 34 year olds, and they only one five percent would say they have a friend who would say pornography is wrong. Right, exactly. You take 